Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that convict iron jaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That is way. Way. Blank is the killer. Hello and welcome to Blank is the Killer, the unoriginal horror movie podcast where I, your host Josh Baker, cover six new-to-me horror movies with a random spooky topic seven at the end. This episode will contain killer mothers, mother killers, and different dimensions. I just realized how many killer mothers ended up in this episode. Accidental themes are the best themes. Look out for your mother as we pop into this episode. Number 1, Truth or Dare, 2017, directed by Nick Simon. A girl and guy are at a house playing Truth or Dare. The guy ends up dying during his dare, and the girl survives hers. Decades later, a group of friends go hang out at the same house. They start playing Truth or Dare. The truths tear the group apart while the dares start physically hurting and killing them. Some members of the group talk to the original survivor, who tells them how to beat the game. Everyone but two girls end up dead. One of the girls is dared to kill the other, so she crashes a car they are both in. One survives without the audience knowing who. Probably the girl named Alex, who was driving. The evil truth or dare force and Alex are the killers. Alex crashes the car, which kills the other girl, allegedly. I found out this is a sci-fi movie that was put out by a company that's whole deal is to make crappier versions of movies that already exist to trick people into watching them. I knew that this was a crap ripoff of the Truth or Dare movie I already covered, but I didn't know it was originally aired on sci-fi. You got me, sci-fi. You got me to watch another one of your stupid movies. Luckily for me, this was nowhere near as bad as the Pumpkinhead sequels. Don't get me wrong. Truth or Dare is still awful. The acting is dreadful. The most generic sound effects are used for things they don't match at all. Multiple scenes have odd silence when background music is needed. To sum up everything, it's a made-for-sci-fi movie. That being said, I found it kind of enjoyable in the so-bad-it's-good sort of way. I mean, to make this movie fun to watch, you have to see it with other people and make fun of it the entire time. I don't think anyone would enjoy watching this by themselves. Let's go over the dares, shall we? There are truths too, but who cares? The first dare requires a young man to put his hand on a hot stove. It doesn't say where to touch the stove. This is the easiest dare. He doesn't even try to do it, so the demonic entity makes him put his hand on the red-hot burner, causing his palm skin to melt off onto it. Yeah, if you don't do the dare, the dare does you. That's exactly how the movie phrases it. Next dare, girl has to eat dude's burnt skin chips. This is the easiest dare of the entire movie. Gross? You butter believe it. Physically harmful like every other dare? Nope. The girl eats a piece, then the demon calls the group and says she needs to eat all of it. That doesn't seem fair. The dare was to eat the burnt skin. It never said how much of it she had to eat. Moving on, another dude is dared to touch the wires. Wires then pop out of the ceiling with live ends. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Touch the wires where they are still covered in insulation. Homie doesn't even try this. He grabs the live ends and has someone tackle him with a blanket right after he starts getting electrocuted. So, he's technically just shocked since he lives. Now I'm going to cover a truth. A girl is asked if she's a drug addict. She lies about it, so the demonic force kills her. Really? Why wouldn't you just admit you're an addict? Who cares? This is the dumbest death of the entire movie. She randomly trips backwards and lands on a pipe. No one really cares that she dies, even though she's the first death in the movie. I feel like I'd be a bit shaken up if one of my friends died in front of me. After this girl's death, everyone now understands the stakes. So the next dare is for a dude in the group. He's told to hang himself for two minutes. A noose then crashes through the ceiling. The demon loves making things appear from the ceiling. 
Mr. Idiot decides to not do the dare, so you know what happens. The dare does him. All he had to do was put his foot into the loop and hang upside down. But instead of even trying that, he declines to do the dare, even though he knows he'll die for sure if he doesn't. At this point, you're probably thinking, wow, this section sucks. All Josh is doing is going over the stupid dares. You'd be correct. The dares are really all there is to talk about when going over this movie. The acting is horrendous. The dialogue is written by an alien. The cinematography is boring and straightforward. Everything is awful. The gore is passable, and I'm about to get to more gore. We jump to a dude who I forgot was dared to have his knee bashed in. It was bashed in. Now he's dared to rob a convenience store. He's even given a gun by the demon. Thing is, all he has to do is take a candy bar. He instead tries to stick up the store and is shot dead by the woman behind the counter who has a shotgun. Yeah, it's dumb. Throughout all these dares, our terrible final girl Alex doesn't have to go for some reason. The next dare is for someone to drink something. It looks like Drano. The doctor of the group smells it and confirms it's poison by smell. That must be something you learn in doctor school. The liquid is split between everyone, they down it, and then everyone starts throwing it up. Dumb. After this, a revolver and a bullet appears. The dare is stated like this. One bullet, three shots. Something like that. It doesn't say they have to play Russian Roulette, which they instantly decide must be done. Alex, being a martyr, decides to go first. Gee, Alex, you haven't had to do a dare, and you're going to offer to go first in Russian Roulette, thus giving yourself the greatest chance of not taking the bullet to the head? So brave. Why are y'all even pointing the gun at your heads when the dare doesn't even tell you to do that? No one knows. Alex obviously survives the first shot, the doctor then pulls the trigger twice, ending in his head being blown off. Why the group decided the doctor should do it? Who knows? I'll skip over some other dumb dares since this movie is taking up way too much time. Eventually, only Alex and one other girl are left. They are dared to remove seven living body parts. They start with a hair on one of their heads, an eyelash, and a fingernail. Okay. You might be able to say the root of the hair and eyelash are alive, but fingernails are made of dead cells. They are not alive. That does not count. This demon has been a jerk about every other dare, so I have no idea why the demon would be cool with a fingernail counting towards the dare. They then cut off an earlobe, finger, toe. The last thing Alex cuts off is the other girl's foot. Yep, this is all ridiculous and stupid. Then Alex is dared to kill the other girls, so she crashes a the car they're both in for some reason. The crash is shown off screen due to the budget, I'm assuming. How you could cheap out on the ending of your movie, I'll never know. Don't watch the sci-fi truth or dare movie. It's terrible. If you decide to watch it, get drunk with some friends. Number 2, Malevolent, 2018, directed by Olaf Dufleur Johannesson. Two siblings, Jackson and Angela, and two of their friends, Beth and Elliot, are running a fake medium scam. Angela inherits her mother's gift that allows her to see the dead for real. The gang goes to a big house at the behest of an old lady. Three foster girls were allegedly murdered by the lady's son in the house. During the gang's investigation, Elliot falls through the floor, breaks his ankle, and reveals a room that shows the lady had a big hand in torturing and killing the kids. The son is still there. The son captures Beth. Jackson finds Beth, and they get into their car where Angela and Elliot are waiting for them. Jackson runs over the mansion's groundskeeper because he thinks he's one of the ghost girls. This causes him to crash the car. Beth dies during the crash. Jackson is taken inside by the son has his tongue removed and mouth sewn shut. Angela wanders in after him and is captured. Elliot then hobbles into the mansion, kills the son, and looses Angela's restraints. Angela then kills the old lady. Angela walks down a road to get help and sees Jackson's ghost before being rescued by a passing car. Angela and Elliot make it to a hospital and survive. The old lady, her son, and their groundskeeper are the killers. I'm assuming the groundskeeper was in on all this. The dead little girl ghost tricked Jackson into running over the groundskeeper, which is all the proof I need to know that that bastard was in on the murders. From the synopsis, I assumed Malevolent would be a paranormal horror movie, 
So when it's revealed that the old lady who runs the orphanage is really the thing the gang of fraudsters should be afraid of, I was shocked. Well, shocked isn't the right word. Cat, who was watching with me, called it as soon as the old lady came on screen, so I was more pleasantly surprised this wasn't solely a paranormal film, since ghosts aren't normally my cup of tea. Unless we're talking the 13 Ghosts remake. Love that movie. Anyway, Malevolent is a decent horror film that subverted my expectations. Is it a masterpiece? No. Is it an amusing film? Yes. Does it have some huge glaring plot issues? Definitely. Am I going to complain about them now? Of course. I'm going to jump to the part in the movie where Jackson crashes the car. It's silly that Jackson loses complete control of the car, thus crashing it, after running over the groundskeeper, but I'll ignore that. Post car crash, the creepy old lady's creepy weirdo son comes out, picks up Jason, and takes him inside. Angela then comes too and decides to go into the house after him. Why? Who knows? She finds the old lady, her son, and Jackson, and before Angela can do anything, she's instantly captured. She had no plan. She should have tried to get herself and Elliot to safety instead of playing hero. After Angela's escape, Elliot comes too. Elliot's leg is all kinds of messed up, so he grabs the groundskeeper's serendipitous crutch and hobbles to the house. Somehow Elliot is able to get the upper hand and mortally wound the son while also having enough time to partially loosen Angela's restraints, which allows her to escape and kill the mother. The chance of Elliot being able to pull this off must have been 0.01%. But luckily for him, the mother and son did not hear Elliot loudly clunking around with his bum leg and crutch. Barring Angela and Elliot deciding to re-enter the house, I found the story to be a lot of fun. I guess you could say that Angela and Elliot weren't thinking clearly after being in a car crash and probably suffering concussions, but no matter how concussed they are, it doesn't make sense that they don't even try to arm themselves before locating the mother and son in the house. Malevolent is shot surprisingly well. There are a lot of interesting shots that I didn't expect to see in this type of movie. Normally with horror movies I find on Netflix, cinematography is stiff and boring, so kudos there. The gore in this is pretty well done. We get cut off tongues, sewn up mouths, big gashes, a bloody broken ankle, and two neck stabs. The gore is practical and works. The acting isn't all that bad, but there are definitely a lack of realistic reactions to a ton of the things that happen. Spooky ghosts? Not phased. Our friend is all bloody and messed up? There's probably a reasonable explanation, so there's no need to freak out. There should be a lot more freaking out in this movie. One thing I almost forgot, the old lady has a process for making people quiet. She cuts out their tongues, then sews their mouths shut. For some reason, she starts sewing up Angela's mouth before cutting out her tongue. The movie should have ended with Angela still being saved, but she should have had her tongue removed. The movie tries to say it's set in the 80s, but nothing besides Jackson's Walkman that he continuously listens to self-help tapes on screams 80s. Jackson is a huge douchebag, but with a name like that, he never had a chance. Malevolent, which is stylized as Male Volant on Netflix for no reason, is a fun time that feels fresh. Check it out. Number 3, Hold the Dark, 2018, directed by Jeremy Saulnier. A woman named Medora Sloan's son is taken by wolves. She sends a letter to a writer named Russell who knows a lot about wolves. He goes to help her, figures out the wolves didn't do it, and finds the body of the son, whom Medora strangled in the basement. Medora's husband, Vernon, returns home from a war, sees his son's body, kills some cops, steals the body, does a strange ritual burial with the help of his friend Chion, and goes off to hunt down Medora. The cops show up at Chion's place to ask about the murders, which leads to Chion killing a bunch of cops before being taken out. A cop and Russell then go to a location Medora talked about. There, Vernon kills the cop, Russell finds Medora, Vernon injures Russell, is about to kill Medora, but they decide to get back together. They leave and Russell is found by a father and son and taken to a hospital where he finally gets to see his daughter. War, Medora, Vernon, and Chion are the killers. Yeah, what a crazy all over the place summary. You can probably tell from that summary 
that Hold the Dark's plot is random and almost completely nonsensical. Most of what happens makes no sense. Why is the writer going to hunt a wolf for a random woman in Alaska? I mean, he says he was using the trip as an excuse to go to Alaska and possibly see his daughter who's there, but that doesn't make the decision to go help some rando lady find a wolf any less insane. Why does Medora kill her son? Was she bored or something? Russell says wolves eat their young when they don't have food. Medora doesn't eat her son, so that's not it. Why does Vernon kill the cops? To steal the body of his son? Does he not realize that the body is released to the family upon request? Before Vernon kills the cops, there's a scene in the movie of him at war. He hears another soldier forcing himself on a woman. Vernon intervenes and stabs the soldier a bunch of times before handing the knife to the woman and walking away. He then gets shot in the neck, survives, and is sent home. At first I thought this scene was going to set up that Vernon is a good guy. It's a quick way to show that he does the right thing, even when he could have easily walked away from the situation. I was 100% sure he was going to die after being shot solely because why else would they show him help that woman? Why include a rape scene in your movie if it has absolutely nothing to do with the plot or characters? It's pointless to show Vernon do something heroic if you're going to have him murder a bunch of innocent people for no reason right after. The movie is too long as is. We don't need to see Vernon during the war at all. Just have a voicemail play when Russell gets back to the house that says Vernon's coming home. Why does Cheon kill the cops? Funsies? They didn't help a ton when his daughter went missing. Okay, sure. I get being a little peeved about that, but Cheon is so enraged that he has a heavy machine gun set up in his attic just waiting for a bunch of cops to show up at his house. Really, Cheon? How did you even know a bunch of cops would show up at your house? This one is somewhat explained by the cops identifying that the gun used to kill the cops earlier on was Cheon's, but still. Vernon goes on a rampage to find and kill Medora for killing his son. Find the person who killed your son and take revenge. That makes sense. So why in the name of all that is holy does he not kill her when he finds her? He's killed a bunch of random innocent people during his time back in Alaska, but when it comes to the one person who's actually done something that could be deemed punishable by death, Vernon decides to forgive her, bang, and become a couple again. In the words of Sheila Broflowski, what, what, what? Why does anyone in this movie do anything? What is the motivation behind their actions? I'm a big fan of Jeremy Saulnier. The movie looks great. It's put together amazingly well. The problem is the plot is a jumbled mess that only raises questions instead of answering any of them. Macon Blair wrote the screenplay for this movie. He's acted in all of Saulnier's movies. Macon wrote, I don't feel at home in this world anymore, which is a fun time. What the hell happened with Hold the Dark, Macon? Hold the Dark is based on a book by the same name, and it appears the adaptation is pretty faithful to the book. I think in the book you find out Vernon killed someone before going off to war, which I don't think is brought up in the movie. Is it important to know? Not really. It kind of helps explain his murder all the things nature a little, but the rampage is still completely ridiculous. Macon, I don't blame you for this. You brought a terrible book to terrible life. You would have had to completely rewrite the story to not make it terrible. Maybe I still blame you though if it was your decision to write a screenplay for the book without being approached and offered a large sum of money since there is no reason for such an awful plot to be adapted. The author, William Giraldi, doesn't even have a Wikipedia page written about him. The book Hold the Dark doesn't either. I'm sitting here scratching my head. I think Blue Ruin and Green Room are incredible films. Murder Party is just alright, but overall I've loved Jeremy Saunier's work. Even though Hold the Dark is beautifully crafted with decent acting given the lack of any reasonable motivation for the characters, the plot is so bad and all over the place that I don't recommend checking out Hold the Dark. Go watch any of Saulnier's other movies instead or Macon Blair's I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. Number 4, Psycho, 1960, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. A woman named Marion steals $40,000 from a client at her job. She then leaves town and stays at the Bates Motel. She hangs out with the guy who runs the motel, Norman Bates, for a bit after overhearing his mother, Norma, yell at him. Marion is then murdered by Norma. A PI goes looking for Marion. 
The detective gets close to the truth and is murdered by Norma. Marion's lover and sister contact a local sheriff after the P.I. goes silent. He tells them Norma has been dead for 10 years. The lover and sister go to the Bates Motel. The sister finds Norma's corpse and is attacked by Norman, who's dressed as his mom, Norma. The lover saves her and Norman is arrested. His personality has been split between himself and his mother, and Norma has fully taken over. A psychiatrist explains everything. Norman Bates is the killer. First off, there are famous movies you probably haven't seen, listener. Don't judge me. I've seen other Hitchcock film. Yeah, film. Singular. Rear window. It's great. I know I should watch more of his stuff and plan to in the future. Since Psycho has been ingrained in popular culture for decades, I had practically seen it before actually sitting down for a full viewing, but technically, I hadn't seen Psycho until now. Psycho is a masterfully crafted film with amazing cinematography and a great score. I especially love the camera work during Marion's death. It's also really interesting during the P.I.'s demise, even though him falling down the stairs comes off as incredibly unnatural. The tumble is still a really interesting shot. Sometimes the score is a little dramatic given what's happening, but overall it's very strong and memorable. The acting is old-timey, but still good. Anthony Perkins' performance as Norman Bates is great. Everyone else is just kind of there. Janet Leigh played Marion. Psycho starts off by following her as she runs off with a bunch of money. Marion is the most conspicuous criminal ever. A cop approaches her after he finds her asleep in her car on the side of the road. The cop has no reason to believe she's stolen a bunch of money until Marion opens her mouth and basically says, I am 100% trying to get away with something shady. Through the way she acts when talking to the officer. She instantly buckles before the cop even starts questioning her. If Norman didn't end up killing her, Marion would have definitely been caught. She couldn't act cool to save her life. There are two things I didn't love about the movie audio-wise. Janet Leigh's infamous scream doesn't match her mouth at all. This is a pivotal scene in the movie. It's iconic. I just wish the scream matched better. I want all of you to watch that scene and let me know if I'm being overly critical. The other thing I didn't love was Norma's voice. I think you could have had Anthony Perkins do some sort of believable impression instead of having the voice be someone completely different. Interestingly enough, Norma's voice was a combination of three people, none of which were Anthony Perkins. Virginia Gregg, Paul Jasmine, and Jeanette Nolan had their voices combined to create Norma's voice. Ann Dorr and stuntwoman Margot Epper played Norma during the shower kill, and a dwarf actress, Mitzi Kostner, played Norma during the stair kill. It's kind of insane how many people had a hand in playing Norma. This was done to make the reveal as shocking as possible. I'll be honest, since I knew the twist going in, I didn't realize that Anthony Perkins wasn't the actor that played Norma during those kills. I just assumed it was him. Considering this is a classic, it has a ton of trivia associated with it, I'm going to fire off some now. Psycho was the first American film ever to show a toilet flushing on screen. Janet Leigh is Jamie Lee Curtis's mom. Alfred Hitchcock used Hershey's syrup instead of blood because it showed up better on camera. Hitchcock said the music is what made the movie a success. Shout out to the composer Bernard Herrmann. He worked on another little movie called Citizen Kane as well as many others. Like myself, Hitchcock hated the infamous psychiatrist explanation scene done at the end of the movie. He felt the scene was boring and the movie came to a grinding halt at that point. The scene has also been ripped to shreds by critics over the years as the worst scene in the movie and one of Hitchcock's worst scenes ever. Both Hitchcock and viewers felt the scene was unnecessary, overly obvious, and too talky, slowing down the action and suspense of the rest of the movie. But there was a strong pressure from the studios and powers that be that funded and distributed the movie to relieve the pressure from earlier scenes and also to explain the action to less insightful audience members who might be confused by the big reveal at the ending. So the scene was kept in. That big snippet was lifted from IMDB Trivia. I thought having the psychiatrist explain everything was a terrible and boring way to end the movie, so I'm glad I'm in good company when it comes to that opinion. You gotta hate studio interference. 
The movie should end when Norman is revealed to be Norma, as he's subdued by Marion's lover. You should definitely give Psycho a watch. It's a beautifully crafted, iconic film. Number 5, Terrified, also known as Alterados. 2017, directed by Demian Rugna. A woman hears voices coming from a drain that say they're going to kill her. Her husband comes home. She goes to the bathroom to take a shower. Her husband goes next door since he thinks their neighbor is banging on the wall. When the husband comes back home, he finds his wife floating in the air, smashing into the walls. She dies. The husband is being questioned by paranormal investigators in an asylum. We go back in time. The neighbor is shown struggling with a weird presence in his house. He gets proof that something is in his home. A kid drinks water from a hose in front of the neighbor's house. The neighbor tells the kid to go away, which leads to the kid backing into the street and getting run over by a bus. The kid comes back as a zombie. After this, the paranormal investigators show up as well as a deputy. A bunch of weird things are shown. A parallel dimension is bleeding into this world. All the investigators die. The deputy burns down all the houses where the events were happening. In the present, new people question the husband who tells them he sees one of the dead investigators behind them. A chair starts moving. The parallel dimension beings are the killers. This is a horror movie from Argentina. What do I think of this film? Well, I feel it drags in places. We start the movie off with a bunch of spooky high energy. The first death shows a woman flying around a room bashing into the walls. This comes off as comedic to me. It's like she learns how to fly, doesn't have a great grasp on it, and refuses to take a break after continuously making contact with the walls, which ultimately leads to her death. She's actually weirdly thrown around by some unseen thing from another dimension. I like the idea of some hellish dimension spilling over into the one we're presented. The concept that you can only see these other dimensional beings from certain angles is interesting and probably the biggest strength of the film. The first being we get to see is a strange, tall, naked man thing that resides in the neighbor's house. It's truly unsettling. The problem is, after we are introduced to this truly freaky creature, we spend a load of time on a little boy that comes back to life and goes home. We barely see the boy move on camera. He turns his head slowly to look at a friend he had while he was alive who's hanging outside. The little zombie boy is creepy, but he feels a little out of place with all the other weirdness that is going on. There are other creatures besides the tall naked man. All of the other dimensional things look great. Most of them are partially humanoid. They all move oddly and exude a certain haunting energy. Most of the effects work surrounding the creatures is well done. There is a lot of CGI used for the naked man, which works given that he's supposed to be out of this world. I believe practical effects were used for him also. He's great. Another creature kills the woman investigator with a large clawed hand. It grabs her head and breaks her neck. I believe this was done with stop motion. The effect looks a little janky. The design of that creature is fantastic. It felt very Cronenberg to me. The zombie boy's design is great and off-putting. I think having the zombie boy barely move was the right choice. He should have been given less screen time though. The gore in this is fine. There isn't a ton, but what's shown is well done. The acting is hard to put a finger on. It seems mostly good, but the way the investigators react to certain things is puzzling. Should you pay for Shudder just to watch Terrified? Nope. Does that mean you should skip it? Also nope. Terrified is a unique enough horror film to warrant a watch. While it isn't completely groundbreaking and is rough around the edges, it's a good enough time. The most entertaining bits are obviously the ones involving the dead and interdimensional beings. The runtime is an hour and 30 minutes, which feels more like two hours due to the poor pacing. If you enjoyed movies like The Void, you'll probably dig this. Number 6, Fresh Meat 2012, directed by Danny Mulherin. A gang retrieves one of their members from custody. The members are Gigi, Richie, Johnny, and Polly. Looking for a place to hide, they burst into a suburban home and capture the family who resides there. The family includes Rena, who just came back from an all-girl boarding school, her brother Glenn, and their parents, Hemi and Margaret. 
Gigi has a soft spot for Rena, so she kills Richie, who's been trying to force himself on slash murder the schoolgirl. Before this, a trap kills Polly in the family's secret basement, and Johnny shoots a nosy cop dead. Everyone in the family besides Rena are cannibals on purpose. Rena was sent some human-based snacks from her family. The family gets the upper hand, kills Johnny, and knocks out Gigi. Rena's random friend comes over and is killed. Gigi and Rena are tied up but get loose. Hemi rips his son's heart out, eats it, and drinks some of Rena's blood. She's supposed to be a virgin, but she says she's not. She's into girls. Hemi needed to consume his son's heart and daughter's virgin blood to become immortal. SWAT storms the house. Hemi kills them. Gigi tries to take him down but accidentally cuts off Margaret's arm. Hemi kills Margaret. Rena uses the gas from the stove to blow up her dad. Gina tackles her through a glass sliding door right when the explosion happens to save her. Rena and Gigi are now a thing even though it's statutory. Hemi, who's still alive, pops up from the ground where the house burnt down as a final scare. Gigi, Richie, Johnny, Polly, Hemi, Margaret, and Glenn are the killers. The gang killed cops and the family, barring Rena, killed and ate people. Well, she ate people too, but she didn't know it. This is a New Zealand horror movie, and I'm sad to say this is the first New Zealand horror movie I've seen that I don't recommend. You had a good run, New Zealand. What We Do in the Shadows, Housebound, Black Sheep, Deathgasm, Brain Dead, Bad Taste, all great New Zealand horror movies that have been touched on in this podcast. Well, I haven't talked about Housebound. It's great. Along comes fresh meat to ruin the great New Zealand horror movie streak. When I selected this movie, I thought it would be pretty bad, but when it started by saying it was a New Zealand film, my heart filled with hope. Too bad fresh meat isn't fresh. What were the creators of this movie going for? The tone is all over the place. I wouldn't even call this a horror movie. It's just a really crappy comedy. I feel like the premise of the film somewhat works. A group of criminals try to lay low only to find out the people they are staying with are cannibals. Wait a minute. I've already seen this movie. It's called Frontiers. I talked about it during my dive into French Extremity. Frontiers came out five years before Fresh Meat. If you remember, I didn't love Frontiers, but if I had to recommend a movie where a gang and a family of cannibals meets up, I'd say Frontiers. That's because it is coherent and keeps the same tone throughout. During my viewing of Fresh Meat, I think they wanted me to find some things funny and others disturbing. Terrible songs are played throughout to force certain tones. This doesn't work in the least. Fresh Meat wants you to be happy about Gigi and Rena ending up together, but doesn't realize that it's weird to root for a woman in her 30s to end up with a high school girl. It's creepy. All you had to do was make Rena a college student, but in the movie she specifically refers to herself as a schoolgirl. We're supposed to root for this romance, and we're also supposed to find her gropey childhood friend's advancements as humorous. Another interesting addition in the movie is racism against Asians. The racism comes from Hemi, who continuously brings up injustice to Maori people, then turns around and is racist towards other minorities. The family is Maori. Other stupid things in the movie include a silenced revolver, random CGI used for things like a garage door, someone's head looking like it was cut off at the neck after another character shoots said head in the back point blank with the shotgun, and an uncomfortable scene where Richie tries to force himself on Rena, dresses up in her underwear, and gets his penis bit, which isn't the least bit funny. There is some decent gore towards the end, but I doubt anyone makes it that far unless you are watching this terrible movie for a podcast. This movie sucks. Don't waste your time with fresh meat. Watch any of those New Zealand films I talked about instead. Specifically Housebound, because you've probably heard of all the others. Number 7. The Haunting of Hill House Hullabaloo if you have been on the internet or chatted up your coworkers or friends in the past couple weeks, you've probably heard about this confusingly named show. Why is it called The Haunting of Hill House? Is it supposed to make me confuse it with House on Haunted Hill? 
I know all you viewers have already seen the Vincent Price version of House on Haunted Hill. If you haven't, get on it. For this segment, I'm talking about the new Netflix show, The Haunting of Hill House. You've heard the hype and probably want to know if you should buy into it. I'm going to start off avoiding spoilers. The Haunting of Hill House is a beautifully crafted show that's heavy on family drama with a splash of horror. Even though the horror ends up taking a back seat at times, the horror that does pop up throughout is great. The show is definitely eerie and spooky for most of the episodes. There are some genuinely scary moments. You learn about the Crane family's past living in the house and how they are doing in the present. The past and present are intertwined. The first half of the show basically features a character per episode. You learn more and more about the Hill House the longer you watch the show. The acting for the most part is strong enough. There are definitely some weak links like Young Nell, Young Hugh, and the Dudleys. Most of the visual effects in this are amazing, barring some badly CGI'd bugs. The show is worth watching. I'm going to jump into spoilers now, so if you haven't finished watching, it's time to duck out of this episode and come back when you're done. Everyone still listening has seen the show or doesn't care about spoilers? Cool, here we go. One character I didn't bring up during the acting callouts is Poppy. Poppy is a random character who pops up in the second half of the show. She's said to have been one of the OG Hill House residents, and we're told that she was literally insane. This very out of the blue, lame character ends up being the catalyst for the mother, Olivia's insanity. Basically, the house has been driving her crazy due to the house being a hungry evil that wants people to die in it to feed its hunger. Poppy is the main ghost in the house that tells Olivia she's dreaming when she's not, and that she needs to murder her kids to wake them up and keep them safe forever. It's revealed that Olivia tried to kill her two youngest kids, Nell and Luke, and actually succeeded in killing a little girl that was randomly there by giving them all rat poison infused tea. The random girl drinks and dies, Hugh bursts in and saves the other two kids, gathers up all the other children, gets them in the car, and drives off. Poppy then talks Olivia into killing herself, basically. First off, the actor who plays Poppy is terrible. She plays Poppy as a stereotypical 1920s flapper, but she never feels genuine or sinister. She's just kind of there. There's an episode called Screaming Mimi's where Poppy continuously uses that ridiculous phrase, which sounds incredibly stupid. I just looked up the term and it's defined as nervous hysteria. The phrase Screaming Mimi's was first used in the 1940s. During the climax of the show, the family members who are still alive go back to Hill House. Poppy boops the characters on the face one by one, which causes them to go unconscious. It's hilarious. I can't understate how stupid these boops are. Poppy should have been replaced by a menacing ghost. Honestly, there doesn't even need to be a ghost that talks Olivia into thinking she's dreaming. She already believes that. For the Josh's cut of The Haunting of Hill House, Poppy is removed. She's pointless and really hurts the tone of the show. She'd be replaced by Olivia in the scenes where she boops the kids, but instead Olivia would probably just put a hand on their shoulder or something. Less stupid. Speaking of hurting the tone of the show, the show ends after the dad sacrifices himself, which allows all the kids to leave the house. The mom wouldn't let them leave without the sacrifice, so the kids escape and we get some terrible, cheesy, lifetime garbage exposition by the oldest kid, Steven, that's played along with one of the lamest, happy-go-lucky songs I've ever heard in my life over scenes showing everyone living happily ever after. Um, what? Who okayed this ending? The tonal shift practically gave me whiplash. The entire season... We are beaten over the head with the idea that Hill House is evil. Then in the last 30 minutes of the show, everyone's like, it's not so bad. You can die there and have fun as a ghost forever. What? The house was trying to murder all of you. The house has been murdering for years. The ghosts aren't happy to be there. They are stuck there for all eternity in an evil house. The ending basically goes against all of this. Josh is cut. 
One of the kids dies in the house during the climax. Luke, the drug addict, can OD on the rat poison, but that feels cheap since the ghost injected him with it. No one really liked Steve, so you can have him be the one that meets his demise. After this, the dad still sacrifices himself. Theo learns the truth about what happened the night they left Hill House, and Luke, Shirley, and Theo escape. You then have creepy piano music play as Ghost Steven narrates how the house is truly evil. No one is able to rest in peace there. He can basically reiterate what Theo says she felt like after touching Nell's body. And then Steve ends his monologue saying that even though his siblings escape the house, it'll always haunt them. That's an ending that doesn't completely flip the tonal table at the end. So much happens in The Haunting of Hill House, so sorry if this section sounds like the rambling of some insane old geriatric. To put a nice bow on this section, The Haunting of Hill House is a great show that I recommend. The ending is awful, but everything leading up to it is intriguing and addicting. There you have it. Episode 30, aka XXX, aka XXX, aka Vin Diesel, aka Ice Cube, has come to a close. As always, if you like this podcast, rate it on iTunes. Hit me up on Instagram using the hashtag BlankIsTheKiller. And or whisper your love for Blank is the Killer in your dearest friend's ear. Shoutouts to Sticker Fridge for hosting the podcast. There are a bunch of great podcasts on the network. Check out Basuda Boys when you're somewhere by yourself wearing headphones. It'll make you laugh and feel dirty at the same time. The next episode of Blank is the Killer will be up November 4th. Till then, make sure to always be in a defensive stance while taking a shower. You never know when someone will burst into your bathroom all stab happy.